In our previous video on hypothesis testing, we learned that at the end of a test, we end up either rejecting the null hypothesis or not rejecting the null hypothesis. So there's two decisions we could have made, reject or not reject. Um, in the real world, there's some unknown truth, and it's either that the null hypothesis is correct or that the null hypothesis is incorrect, meaning that the alternative is incorrect. All right, so if we put this into a little matrix, here's the unknown truth. The null is correct or the alternative is correct. And then remember, there's two decisions we could have made. We could have rejected the null or not rejected the null. So if the null was actually correct and we did not reject it, then that's a good thing. We did not make any sort of error. Similarly, if the alternative is correct and we did reject the null, that's another good thing. We did not make an error. So the error comes in on the diagonal here. So if the alternative is correct, but we do not reject the null, then that's called a type two error. Similarly, if the null is correct and we end up rejecting the null, that's called a type one error. All right, so those are just some definitions. Type one error is just um, rejecting the null when it is actually correct. The type two error is re not rejecting the null when the alternative is correct. Okay, so how often do these errors happen? Well, we can call something the significance level and define that alpha. And that is the probability that a type one error happened. So in other words, the probability that we will reject the null even though in reality the null is correct is what we call alpha, the significance level. And then the probability of um, committing a type two error is what we're going to call beta. And later we'll talk about how one minus beta is the power of a test. Okay, so we can see we have these different two types of errors. Um, type one error and type two error. All right, so let's see how often these happen. Let's check out the alpha and beta in a specific example. So from the last video, we're going to continue on with that example there. And we had the decision rule from the last video that we're going to reject the null hypothesis if our sample mean is greater than 53, and we will not reject the null hypothesis if our sample mean is less than 53. All right, so again, just remember we had a normal distribution Known variance 36, unknown mean of mu. And we said our null hypothesis is mu equals 50, alternative hypothesis is mu equals 55. So let's say that we go out and take a sample of size n equals 16. All right, so we're trying to figure out if we have a sample of size n equals 16, what's the probability that we will mistakenly reject the null hypothesis? Similarly, if we have a sample size of n equals 16, what's the probability that we will mistakenly not reject the null hypothesis. So those are alpha and beta respectively. Okay, so first let's start with alpha, the probability of a type one error. In other words, the probability of mistakenly rejecting the null. The probability of rejecting the null given that the null is actually true. Okay, so this is just a very general definition of alpha. Um, let's plug in what our null hypothesis is in our case. So in our case, our null hypothesis is mu equals 50. So we go ahead and plug that in there. So we have the probability of rejecting the null given mu equals 50. But we have that decision rule. So we can also write, instead of reject null, we can write what our decision rule is. Our decision rule said reject if x bar is greater than or equal to 53. So we can go ahead and write that here. The probability that x bar is greater than or equal to 53 given that in reality, mu equals 50. That's what our significance level alpha is. All right, well, we can take this further. We can actually crank this down to a single number. So if we go ahead and define a random variable, z, that is standard normal. So let's go ahead and subtract and divide by the same quantity here on both sides. So if we subtract 50 from both sides, and then divide by the standard error of x bar. In other words, we have the square root of 36 divided by the square root of the sample size 16. So in the denominator, we've divided, so we've divided by six over four on both sides. All right, so we've just done the same manipulation to both sides, to both x bar and 53. So we have the probability that x bar minus 50 divided by six over four is greater than 53 minus 50 divided by 6 over 4. Given that in reality, 
mu equals 50. Okay, but this is actually a standard normal random variable because we've subtracted off the mean, which in reality was 50, and we've divided by the standard error of x bar. So this is actually just a standard normal random variable, which we called z. So now this is equal to the probability that z is greater than or equal to 53 minus 50 divided by 6 over 4. All right, so this is just equal to 2. So our probability of committing a type 1 error is just the probability that a standard normal random variable is greater than or equal to 2. All right, so here's our standard normal random variable. Here's 2. And that area shaded there is just the probability of committing a type 1 error. So we can go to a table or we could use PNORM and R to figure out that this area is 0 0.0228. Okay, so what does this all tell us? This tells us that if in reality the null is true, meaning mu truly is 50, if we take a sample of size n equals 16, then about 2.28% of the time, we're going to mistakenly reject the null hypothesis. So in other words, imagine taking a sample of size 16 and then deciding, do we reject or do we not reject based on this rule? And then we do that again. We take another sample of size 16 and decide, do we reject or do we not reject based on this rule? We do that over and over and over and over and over, maybe a million times, then about 2.28% of the time, we're going to end up mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis. All right, so that's our probability of a type one error, the probability of mistakenly rejecting that null hypothesis. All right, how about beta, which is the probability of a type two error, or in other words, the probability of mistakenly not rejecting the null hypothesis. Well, we can calculate beta in a similar way. First, let's just start with the definition of beta. So, Beta is the probability that we do not reject the null, given that the null is actually incorrect. Okay, but what does it mean to not reject the null? Look at our decision rule. We will not reject the null if x bar is less than 53. So let's swap out this statement, do not reject the null, for our actual rule, x bar is greater than 53. Similarly, we can swap out the statement H naught is incorrect or the null is incorrect with what that actually means in the context of our problem here. So if the null is incorrect, then the alternative is correct, meaning mu equals 55. Okay, so we can swap out the statement the null is incorrect for the statement mu equals 55. All right, so our beta, our probability of a type two error we figured out so far is a probability of seeing a sample mean less than 53, given that in reality, mu is equal to 55. Okay, so it should make sense that sometimes, even if the null, sorry, even if the mean truly is 55, we know there's variability in those x bars, so sometimes we're going to end up getting a low sample mean, maybe lower than 53. Okay, so let's continue thinking about this. Let's do the same thing as here and subtract and divide by the same quantity. All right, so let's uh, subtract by 55 on both sides and then divide by the standard error of x bar. So subtract off 55 on each side and then divide by six over four. Again, six is the square root of 36 and then four is the square root of our sample size 16. All right, so then that tells us that beta equals the probability that x bar minus 55 over six over four is less than 53 minus 55 over six over four, given that in reality, mu equals 55. So again, this quantity here is a standard normal random variable, right? Because we know that x bar has a normal distribution with mean 55 and then variability 36 over 16. So we've 
subtract it off the mean, divide it by the standard error, which is just the square root of 36 over 16. So this is just a standard normal random variable. And this is just a number. It ends up equaling negative 4 over 3. All right, so that means that the probability of mistakenly not rejecting the null hypothesis when we have a sample size of 16 is equal to the probability that a standard normal random variable is less than negative 4 over 3. So maybe that's like here. So this is our beta type 2 error. So again, this is a standard normal random variable, so we can go to our table or we can use pnorm in R to figure out that this probability is 0 0.0913. Okay, so again, what does this mean? So imagine that the null is actually incorrect. So in reality, actually mu is equal to 55. So the truth out there is mu equals 55. Now imagine you take a sample of size 16 from this distribution. You calculate its sample mean, and then based on that you decide, okay, reject the null or do not reject the null. Then you get another sample of size 16, follow the same process, end up rejecting or do not rejecting. You do this over and over and over for some huge number of times, maybe a million, maybe 10 million, and then what you'll find is that about 9.13% of the time, you will be uh, mistakenly not rejecting the null. So the correct thing to do would be to reject the null. but 9.13% of the time, you will end up not rejecting the null, and that's incorrect because, in reality, the null is not true. The alternative is true. All right, so that's a little example for our um, probability of a type 1 error here, and then our probability of a two, type 2 error there. So something to note is that we can only know what decision we're making. When we do a hypothesis test, we know whether we end up rejecting the null or whether we end up not rejecting the null. Of course, we don't know the truth. We don't know whether the null is actually correct or whether the, al whether the alternative is actually correct. If we did, then why would we be doing hypothesis testing at all, right? So all we can do is try to um, make this decision to reject the null or not reject the null. So since we only know whether or not we're rejecting and we do not know whether or not the null is in incorrect or correct, then we don't know when exactly we're making a type 1 error, and we do not know exactly similarly when we're making a type 2 error. So all we know is that as statisticians going through our life, we're going to be doing lots of hypothesis tests. And what we know is that some of the time we're going to be making a type 1 error, and some of the time we're going to be making a type 2 error. We'll never know when exactly, we just know that this is bound to happen. So a good thing to know, since we know that this will definitely happen sometimes, a good thing to know would be how often are we going to be committing this type 1 error? And how often are we going to be committing this type 2 error? Okay, so um, something also to say is that error doesn't mean that we as statisticians did anything wrong. We could have crunched all the numbers correctly. We could have um, gotten perfectly a random sample. We could have done every single step correctly, and then just by random chance, we could have ended up with a sample mean that is greater than 53, or we could have ended up with a sample mean that is less than 53 just by random chance, because we know that there's always going to be that variability in our sample mean. So it doesn't mean we did anything wrong when we say type 1 or type 2 error. This is just something that happens because we're statisticians and we're doing hypothesis testing. There's no way that we can avoid type 1 or type 2 errors. 